Welcome, everybody. Great to see you today on this second Sunday of Lent. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. And let me wish all of you a happy St. Patrick's Day. I know a lot of you are of the Irish uh, and Scottish descents and all that, and I'm so glad that all of you are here. We, uh, I gotta st- Before we get started, i got to say a big shout-out to everyone. A lot of you, I see a lot of you who were volunteers yesterday. Uh, we had a great day here at Cinderella's Closet yesterday. Uh, over 190 girls uh, came. We had over 300 people here. This place looked like a bees hive with you know bees going everywhere, uh, but everybody was working so hard. And I got to tell you, the stories are just flowing out. Uh, many of the, the the women who work share have shared with me that they were the ones who received the blessing. And of course, it's often that way. But I got to tell you, out of all those girls that were here, there were many great stories. Some that were. And one girl said, you made a perfect day even better. Uh, one girl it was a paraplegic. She was paralyzed from the, from the neck down. And uh, we provided her with a dress and fitted her. It was just fantastic. And I just can't begin to tell you how uh, I'm so proud that our church is in this ministry and we touched so many lives yesterday. And, and I just want to say a big thank you to all of you who proved gave food, who did any man, money, who volunteered, who sowed, who a lot of you are exhausted this morning, and so I'm going to try to encourage you not to fall asleep during church today, but uh, I know you had a long day, but it was a great day, and God truly took advantage of that and used it for his glory, and I give thanks for that. Let's prepare our hearts now, and let's worship together.
Thank you, Roy. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you for choosing to worship today in the house of the Lord. Will you stand with me as we respond? My reading, the response of reading this uh, listed in your bulletin, and we're also going to remain standing for our opening hymn and prayer. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. The promises, promises of, of God, God will, will never, never be broken. broken. With God as our light, what is there to fear? The promises of God will never be broken. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The promises of God will never be broken. that you take these prayers home and use them throughout the week. Pray with me. God of promises fulfilled, we gather as descendants of Abraham. We stand before you as faithful testimony to your covenant. We assemble as living proof that your love for humanity knows no limits. And when we feel overwhelmed by the stresses of daily life, we need only look at the stars in the sky to remember your abiding faithfulness. When we are overcome with despair by the pain of war and poverty in our world, we need only see the light of a single candle to remember the one that you sent as our light, our strength, and our salvation. We pray this now in the name of that light, Jesus Christ. Amen. Turn to your neighbors and offer a sign of peace and reconciliation.
You may be seated. Oh, it's great to see all of you today. We're glad you're here. Our ushers are already passing out the attendance pads, and thank you for that uh, information you provide us there. Fill it out, pass it to the next person in your pew. Make sure that everybody on your row signs that and fills that out. And then pass it, when it gets to one end, pass it back to the other so that you can know everybody on your row before you go today. While you're doing that, get out your bulletin. A couple of things that I wanted to just mention. Uh, first of all, I uh, want to remind you that the Mountain Mission Truck will be here very early in the morning. And so if you have things you would like to donate to the Mountain Mission, make sure they get over on the front porch at the Lighthouse uh, this afternoon. Uh, the truck will be here very early, so uh, I plan on doing that. And then I wanted to mention that Triple L has a great meeting this uh, Thursday at 11.30 for Bring Your Own Sandwich and, and uh, come and share in some planning. And then at 1 o'clock, we have a senior health fair that's going to be here. Uh, be a wonderful time for those of us that are beginning to mature in years to gain some great information. Everything from uh, long-term care to law to uh, uh, health issues, uh, there, there are... Uh, what about 20? I think display set it going to be set up. So it should be an excellent health fair. And that'll be in Asbury Hall in the gym as well, starting from one until three o'clock on Thursday. So invite your friends and your neighbors, get them to come and be a part of that. It'd be a great opportunity. Don't forget the Methodist men have their pancake breakfast uh, this coming Saturday and uh, come and join us for that. That'll be a, always a good time. And uh, that, that the uh, proceeds from that go to support their mission work that they do in our area. There are a lot of other uh, opportunities and announcements in your bulletin. Take your bulletin home with you and be a part of everything that's happening here at First Church. Before I share the prayer today, I want to share the Old Testament lesson from the book of Genesis in chapter 15. After these things, the word came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram also said, You have given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and he said, Look toward heaven and count the stars, if you're able to count them. And then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. And then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But Abram said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these and cut them in two and laid each half over against the other. But he didn't cut the birds in two. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. And when the sun had gone down and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your descendants, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Join me in prayer, will you? Holy and loving God, we gather here in this place today and we seek, O oh Lord, the fulfillment of your vision that you have for your church. We thank you for 
the blessings and for the care that you have provided for us since we last met. And we thank you, Lord, that today we can come to this place to offer you our best. We know, God, that we are broken by our sinfulness. But we thank you through the, through the grace of Christ that we have forgiveness, mercy, that our lives can be made whole once again, even in the midst of brokenness, pain, and hurt. We know, Lord, that you raise us up and you give us hope. And today we pray that as you touch our lives, you will also touch those that have special need. There are many in our community of faith that are sick and hurting. And we pray that as the great physician, your healing power will come and be upon them. We pray for your consoling spirit. We pray that your comfort be upon those that grieve. And Lord, today we, we take time to pray, as always, for our church. We pray for your guidance and discernment and wisdom upon us that we would do here in this place what you need us to do and be to be the church. We reflect on the events of our world and we think about our Muslim sisters and brothers in New Zealand that faced a terrible tragedy this week. We pray your comfort and healing upon them as well. Lord, all your children gather today and we gather in this place to give you praise and glory. And so now bless us as a church, bless our leaders, bless the leaders in our community, in our commonwealth, our nation, in our world. And Lord, as always, bless those that protect us. May your goodness be upon us all now as we unite our hearts and our voices and we pray together the prayer that you taught your own disciples say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
invite our children to come forward now. I think we got some more coming, but we'll go ahead and start. So today, people have on green. Why is that? Why? Said so today is St. Patrick's Day. We're going to ask the grown-ups to, to uh, see if they know the answer to this question. St. Patrick is Irish. Oh, this is, you know what, GNN, they voted yes. St. Patrick was not Irish. St. Patrick was British, but he was taken into slavery into Ireland, and he worked as a shepherd. And when he finally got free and he got to go back to his country, he decided that God was asking him to come back and tell the people about Jesus in Ireland. And that's what he did, even though... They had maybe not been so nice to him earlier. So I have a question. Do you ever, um, do you ever feel lucky? Does anybody ever feel lucky? I don't think uh, the Wildcats felt lucky yesterday. But when we're lucky, I, there sometimes somebody will say, you are so lucky because you got an A on your spelling test or an E, I don't know what grades are today, but you got a hundred on your spelling test. But sometimes you wanna say, I'm not lucky, I studied for my spelling test. Somebody might say, you sure were lucky that you won that con cross country race. And you wanna say, I wasn't lucky, I practiced every day and I worked hard. So sometimes, sometimes we're lucky, sometimes I've, uh, on, uh, they'd say that on St. Patrick's Day, they want you, that, that you're, you uh, are going to have the luck of the Irish. I don't know if that's really true. When I was in school, you know, they said you were lucky, you had, to be, you had to wear green, so you were lucky. If you didn't wear green, they would pinch you. That wasn't very nice, was it? I don't know if that happens anymore. Hopefully it doesn't. But I don't know if any grown-ups are going to admit this. But what they would say is, you don't have on green, I'm going to pinch you. And I'd say, my underwear's green. <laughs> Anybody ever say that? My underwear's green. Because then nobody's going to look at your underwear to see if it was green or not. But anyway, I don't believe that wearing green makes us lucky. I don't believe, I think there's sometimes when um, things happen that might be lucky. But sometimes things happen because we work really hard, right? But there's also things called blessings. There are also things that God give us. And what we're supposed to do with that is we're supposed to give to other people. Just like St. Patrick, he decided to use God's blessing, even though he could have been mean and not wanted to share Jesus' love, he went back and sh shared Jesus' love. Anytime we have something to share and to give, we can thank God for all the good things God does for us by giving to other people. So that's what I want to challenge us today on this St. Patrick's Day is to, if you're lucky, that's good. But if you're blessed, let's try to share our blessings with other, with other people. So I want you all, like we talked about last week, I want us to try to do something good every single day. So let's pray about that. Dear God, we thank you. For sometimes when we're lucky, whether it's winning a game or whether it's uh, finding a penny, whatever it is, God, we thank you for those times, but we really thank you for the blessings you give us. We thank you for the people that love us. We thank you for, for our church, and we ask that you help us love people inside the church and outside the church and help us show your love in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you go, Dr. Phil and I are going to give you a blessing. Um. Let the congregation stand and let's sing number 349. Turn your eyes upon Jesus.
remain standing for the reading of the gospel lesson found in the book of Luke, in chapter 13. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I'm casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way, because it's impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. 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 The city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I have desired to gather your children together, as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you are not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will not see me again until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Be seated. A woman named Karen came to a pastor one day at a church and asked if she could be a part of a Bible study that he was teaching. And of course, he gladly agreed, which eventually resulted in Karen's salvation experience. She accepted Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior in that study. Later, the preacher asked Karen what prompted her to come and want to be a part of that Bible study. And she told the pastor a story about how over a year, a year earlier, her three-year-old son was hit by a car and was critically injured. And during that time, her next-door neighbor, who was a member of that church, was very helpful. Karen told the pastor how her, the lady took care of her other son while she could be at the hospital. She cooked dinner for her family. She did the shopping. She cleaned the house. She washed the laundry. She did all of that without a single complaint and never asked for a single thing in return. And then Karen continued by saying that she had something she didn't have. She knew she was a member of the church. But that's about all she knew about her. And this neighbor was always uh, friendly, had invited Karen to the church in weeks and months that had gone by. But prior to her son's accident, Karen had really nothing to do with the other woman. That's because Karen, when she was growing up, her, her own mother told her that members of that church were judgmental and obnoxious and rude toward anyone who wasn't a member of their church. As Karen told the story, tears began to roll down her face, and she said that her neighbor was nothing like she'd been taught. In fact, just the opposite. And while her son was in the hospital, her neighbor had encouraged her to read the Scriptures, and she eventually did. And she soon discovered that her neighbor had something that she didn't have, and that was a caring Savior named Jesus Christ. My friends, this portion of the gospel lesson that I read to you today, it really takes place in the middle of Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. At this point, nothing's going to stop him, not even threats. And these threats that you heard were serious. Bible scholars say they were the real deal. And the truth is, friends, not all Pharisees, and you know, we give Pharisees kind of a we give them kind of a hard time, and I probably will later in Lent. But Pharisees, friends, not all Pharisees were opposed to Jesus. For example, uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. You remember those two? They, they were the two men who buried Jesus after his crucifixion. But they were Pharisees. But followers, secret followers... Of Jesus. 
Anyways, you heard Jesus had work to do, and he was not about to be deterred. Now, Herod Antipas, who was the leader in that day, uh, as we read about in Luke's gospel, um, Herod Antipas was very subtle, very sneaky leader. And he used stealth to subdue his enemies. For example, he had John the Baptist, you remember, beheaded because he made a foolish promise with, to his stepdaughter, Salome, in the heat of a moment at his birthday party. All told, he was a little, he was like a fox. And if you know anything about farming, you know that foxes will sneak into barns and chicken coops at night to prey on defenseless animals. Anyway, the kingdom of God, which Jesus came to preach and live, was at odds with that entire political system in which Herod Antipas functioned. The two systems could not coexist in harmony. After all, what could Jesus say about someone who had beheaded his, what, second cousin, John the Baptist? Jesus' work, my family, was about restoring our relationship with God. Do you hear that? Jesus' work was about restoring our relationship with God. Unfortunately, what I read to you today was a lament. You understand that word? It was great sadness here. It's a lament over Jerusalem. And it showed that Jesus wasn't completely successful. God genuinely grieved over the hardness of hearts of the people in Jerusalem. And in spite of Satan's control over those people in Jerusalem, God was still trying to make himself available to them. All they had to do was to turn to God in faith. And then Christ, of course, as you heard, wants to restore the covenant that God made with Abraham, which I shared with you from the reading in Genesis. And Christ wants us to imitate him in our work, friends. There's an old adage that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. You've heard that before. We are creatures of conformity. And Jesus wants us to conform to a way of life that he offers us. By being determined to go to Jerusalem in spite of those warnings, Jesus put all the evil forces on notice. Jerusalem, or, uh, Jerusalem had persecuted and they had killed prophets not out of ignorance, but because they had set God aside in favor of their own self-made rules. They would not see any of God's blessings until they accepted Jesus as the Messiah. And I want to say that as Christians, we've talked about this a little bit in, in months gone by, but we have a dual citizenship here. We are citizens of the world, and we're citizens of heaven. And uh, we need to be careful that we not allow that worldly citizenship to really corrupt our heavenly citizenship, rather just the opposite. And the hope is that we will live in expectation by living as Christ lived, as a humble servant to all in faith. Do you hear that? The hope is that we will live in an expectation of living as Christ lived, as a humble servant to all in faith. In other words, we can stand fast in faith, and we should stand fast in faith wherever we are. I don't care if you're in worship or at work or at school or in the line at the store somewhere. But because we have this dual citizenship, if you will, we're going to have some tension at times. We're going to have some temptations. And so we have to remain close to Christ. And as part of our Lenten experience, I want to say to you that we need to be about recommitting our lives every single day. We've got to focus on the truth of God's Word. We, we've got to be fearless in our obedience to God. And in return, we, we have a secure hope in Christ. And it is with great confidence, friends, that I can say to you today that we can trust that. And when we trust Christ, we will be changed. Our hurts will be healed. Our hope will be restored. And loneliness will be relieved. And we will experience Christ's vision accomplished. Now, my family, 
I am no fool. I've done it, and you've done it too. We have all limited God's work in our lives to some extent at some point in our, li- in our living. And even though we were forgiven by Christ, and even though we have experienced new creation in the Lord, there are times, friends, when we resist God's transforming love upon our lives. In our scripture for today, Jesus experienced sadness because of those who would not accept his teachings and his kingdom. His agony over Jerusalem, his hardness and its hardness of heart is the same agony that Christ has for the hardness of hearts of those who are with us in this new Jerusalem today. But that should not diminish the reality of God's absolute sovereignty over us all. Jesus then and and now is in anguish over those who accept, who cannot accept a life that Christ offers. Who are hardened in their hearts to God's plea to come to his kingdom. You know, Jesus was, was saddened by that lost condition of people, and Christ is still saddened today by the lost condition we see in our world. Nevertheless, no matter what we do, God's love for us will never diminish. Do you hear that? God is always ready to help us. God's call upon us uh, calls us by our very names to hear His word for our to for our lives personally, and then for us to go out and to proclaim God's word to the world. We're, friends, in, in short, we're God's plan A. We are God's plan A, and there's no plan B. So I'm going to tell you today that Lent, that Lent calls us to confront those things that stand in the way of answering God's call. We answer God's call by doing His work in our world, and I'm not going to review for you that long list of things that we do as a church, but I wonder, I wonder if we really allow God to guide our lives, what if we don't like the results? What if people join us that are not like us? I I wonder, will God really be there to help us? I I wonder... If we step out in bold faith, what what if we look a little foolish? You see, our desire for a safe, predictable, comfortable life can sometimes close our hearts to God's transforming work if we're not careful. So my family, I want to remind you today. I remind you that God won't necessarily ask you what kind of car you drove. But God will probably ask you, How many people you drove who didn't have any transportation? God won't ask you the square footage of your home, but God may very well ask you how many people you welcomed into your home. God won't ask you about the clothes you have in your closet. God may ask you how many people you helped clothe. God won't ask what your highest salary was, but God may very well ask if you compromised your character to earn it. God won't ask you what your job title was. But God may ask you if you performed your job to the best of your ability. God won't ask you how many friends you had, but God may ask you how many people to whom you were a friend. God won't ask in what neighborhood you lived. But I think God will ask how you treated your neighbor. And God won't ask the color of our skin or any of a hundred different differences among us all today. But God will ask about the content of our character. You see, my family, our gospel lesson for today, it helps us to try to recognize that religious passion drove Jerusalem to murderous ends. And religious passion moved prophets and Jesus to fulfill God's mission at the cost of their lives. The question is, will we, as God's church, follow the example of Jerusalem? 
or Jesus? Will the church stand up and will it actively denounce the persecution of believers in Jesus Christ, not only around the world, but right here in our own pews? Will we raise our voices in, a world to in our world to defend our turf? Or will we adopt a model of faithfulness to God's purposes, even if it means vulnerability and some suffering? We who are called, we who are called to follow in Jesus' footsteps, we're faced with a great challenge. But how we respond may very well determine our eternal destiny. Pray with me, will you? Holy God, in this second Sunday of Lent, game time is over. And now it's a matter of life and death. And so today we seek a discernment, an understanding to try to understand what it is that you need us to do to, guide, to follow this new guidance in your church today. We pray, Holy One, for your purposes to be fulfilled in us. We are but one congregation here, but it can start among us. And so allow your love and your peace and your grace to penetrate our hearts, to connect us to one to another, and to be what you need us to be. We pray this, O oh God. We pray it from the depth of our hearts. In the name of the living Christ. Amen. Amen. As we uh, respond to the word, our ushers are preparing to come forward. So let's prepare ourselves to offer our gifts and our tithes to Almighty God. Let us pray. God of grace and God of glory, we come today to not be like Jerusalem. To love one another, to love like Jesus taught us to love, to see past our sins, to see past our judgment of others, and understand that together as one, all brothers and sisters, we can fulfill your mighty word. So be with us with this offering, accept this offering, and accept those sins that we have, we have done and give them grace, a grace that only Jesus Christ can give. In your son's name we pray.
remain standing for our closing hymn, 348, verses 1 and 4. by our very names, O God, and for that we're grateful. Grateful that you love us enough that you would offer your own Son, Jesus, for us. And so go with us now as we proclaim the greatest news of all. And may your peace, a peace that passes all understanding, abide with us forever and ever. Amen. God bless all of you. And take time to greet one another before you go today. <laughs>